Hi folks, I'm Gabe Turner. And I'm Aliza Vigderman. And this is Are We in the Future? Are We in the Future is a podcast where we watch movies and TV shows with smart home, cybersecurity, or home security elements and answer the important questions about the technology itself. Does this exist today? Can this exist today? Should this exist today? What modern technology would have made this movie last only up through the first act? And of course, are we in the future? Hi, everyone. In this episode, we're discussing The Circle, a 2017 film starring Emma Watson and Tom Hanks, among a really star-studded cast. It's based on a novel of the same name written by Dave Eggers in 2013. So as an intellectual, I did read this book. (laughs) Thank you. Um, And that's why I wanted to watch the movie and, of course, do a podcast episode about it. Uh, I will say the book is much better than the movie, but the themes in both, you know, data, surveillance, privacy are very interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to go ahead and provide our listeners a little bit of a recap of what's going on. So, you know, this movie is about a young woman named May, played by Emma Watson, um, and she works at a company called The Circle uh, in customer support, actually. So, you know, seems pretty harmless, right? Wrong. Uh, the circle, a huge tech company in the vein of Google or Amazon is incredibly anti-privacy. Um, their leader, Mr. Bailey, played by an ever affable Tom Hanks, uh, thinks that everyone's personal information should be public. Um, his biggest product launch is called Sea Change, a high quality, low price and tiny camera that can essentially be vid- hidden from sight. So, you know, you can use these cameras to get real time uh, analytics process to recognize patterns and faces. Uh, you know, he really presents it in this positive light and he actually brings up his own personal experience of using it for surfing so he can actually see how the waves are doing in real time. It's great marketing. Sounds great. Um, sounds great. But it, you know, when people start wearing the cameras all the time, live streaming their every move gets a little dicey. Um, so May kind of stumbles into this important role at the company because she's caught stealing a kayak in the middle of the night um, and she nearly dies. And then she's saved because of these cameras. So she's made the face of sea change sort of in the way that Jared from Subway was made the face of Subway because he lost all that weight. So she's made the face of sea change and she goes transparent. So basically that means that she wears a camera on her shirt 24 seven, except in the bathroom, obvious reasons. Um, and Mm -hmm. she becomes a celebrity, not only within her company, but also in the entire world and millions of people are watching her every move. Right. So May's family are understandably not thrilled about her being the OG influencer, (laughs) Um, you know, but they are glad that the company uh, is paying for their health insurance as dad's, um, as May's father has uh, MS. Um, so after May accidentally live streams them in, let's say, an intimate moment, uh, they decide to <laughs> shut their cameras off. Yeah, that was a weird. I was like, I don't even know what these like accoutrement are necessarily. <laughs> um, but the other person that's not thrilled about May's celebrity status is Mercer, who is her friend from home. And he's actually played by the boy from Boyhood, Eller Coltrane. Um, And he gets really mad at May because she advertises his handmade deer antler chandeliers on her live stream. And then he just gets all these messages of people calling him a deer killer. Uh, So basically May's parents shut their cameras off. Mercer kind of goes MIA and ends his friendship with May. So she's kind of isolated herself sort of in the exact same way that people in cults do. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's strange that it's like the opposite though. Like, right. Like she's like not. But her new cult is the circle. That's also true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just like not secretive cult, in your face cult. Kind of like CrossFit. It's almost like the whole um, world is in the cult. (laughs) Oh my God. Um, CrossFit. uh, I actually did it for a while and and it made me really fit. So I can't really say anything. Um, So the loss of her relationship with her 
uh, good friend and parents like does not slow uh, May down at all. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, she comes up with the idea to have all voter registration and voting go through True You, uh, which is basically one account that combines all internet accounts. Um, she also wants to require every U.S. citizen to have a circle account so that they can vote, pay taxes, parking tickets, essentially anything you do at the DMV, uh, but in one space, in one digital space, that is. So, of course, not everyone wants a circle account, which brings May to her next product, Soul Search. Soul Search is a software that allows you to find people without circle accounts in less than 20 minutes. It crowdsources information from millions of people and uses facial recognition software. So they can use it to find fugitives from justice, which is you know, to me, it seems like a really cool thing. Or they could just use it to find someone that doesn't want to be found like Mercer. So May is doing this presentation, you know, showing soul search to her, to her company and, you know, everyone live streaming. And she tries to find Mercer. And as he's trying to drive away from the people ch literally chasing him with their sea change cameras, he crashes his car and actually accidentally drives off a bridge and he ends up dying. Yeah, this is really sad. And unfortunately, this one, you know, does have a bit of a parallel that this basically exists in, in some places in the world. I've, I've seen it in action. But uh, yeah, I, well, I, not not it wasn't there. But yeah, when I was living in China, this definitely happens. Um, you know, anyway, so even after Mercer's death, uh, May returns to the circle. And in a huge lecture to the company, she announces that Mr. Bailey, um, our favorite uh, you know, uh, Tom Hanks and the other owner, um, played by Patton Oswalt, Tom, um, will be going transparent themselves along with all of the camp and company's data. So, uh, you know, Tom and Patton Oswalt are clearly upset, but they can't really, you know, say anything about it because that's their whole point, right? Like they can't be hypocrites. Uh, so they're supposed to be anti-privacy. Um, so to deal with this, uh, you know, Stinton tries to turn off the electricity, but everyone raises their phones. Uh, the light is on Emma Watson. It's a metaphor. Yeah. That's it. You can never turn off the lights is what. And so at the end of the film, May is kayaking and there's drones flying around her head. Uh, and she is completely given in to this idea of there no privacy, just transparency, as she calls it. She kind of doesn't seem that like she wasn't that sad when she couldn't even speak to her family. Yeah. There's also, we should also point out, there's a lot of other characters in this film, but for the purpose of a quick recap that that's the, like, you those know, are the main ones in the, the film. I would say in the book, there's others that are mm, more important, right, but right. the film kind of other characters were more in the periphery. Well, as a John Boyega fan since attack the block, he loomed larger in my head. Um, you know, cause he saved London from aliens there and he was trying to save the world from the circle in this film, uh, which is pretty interesting. So let's talk about, uh, these elements. I already started to talk a little bit about these elements in real life. Well, first I just want to say some trivia about the movie that I found on IMDb, um, which leads me to my first topic. So the circles campus was actually computer generated in the movie. So it's not real, but it's based on. Apple's real life headquarters, Apple Park, which opened shortly after the movie premiered. And if you Google the two, it'll their resemblance is undeniable. They're, they're both huge circular buildings with green space on the inside. So it's kind of like the rim of a circle is the building. And Apple Park is a mile in circumference and completely made of glass, much like most Apple stores. Wow. So people call it the spaceship, according to Business Insider. Wow. Well. You know, also the floors of all the Apple stores is made from the same stone that they get in the mountain in Italy. And that's those small touches that honestly make them pretty make, great make them pretty good. spaces. Make them pretty good. I worked for Apple in college. Yeah, I know. It was fun. So anyway, what is it like to work <laughs> at Apple? Well, according to former employees on Glasser and Cora, and I think this is more about like Apple corporate versus the actual stores. Sure. Yeah. I could give you some first hand on that one. Yeah. I don't think it's quite as glamorous <laughs> as like working at Apple Park, but basically, you know, if you are a software developer, the pay is awesome. You are making six figures or more. Um, they get great discounts on Apple products and services, and there is a free shuttle service, employee training, and even free apples, the fruit. 
However, that's nothing when you compare it to all the perks that Google employees get. Oh, snap. Go on. Like Apple, Google's based on a huge piece of land, about 12 acres in Mountain View, California, and their employees have all of the perks you could possibly imagine possibly imagine. They have fitness and wellness centers, group cooking classes, three free gourmet meals a day, a bowling alley, beach volleyball, and even a free shuttle with Wi-Fi. And unlike on the Bolt bus, this Wi-Fi actually (laughs) works. Um, And I'm getting this info from the Metro UK, by the way. Uh, That's a very Pacific Northwest Northeast joke, the bolt bus thing, but that's, that's only parts of the country. Yeah. That's I love it. Though. I like very specific niche jokes like it's that. It's weird when I, I don't think of, you know, I don't think of that. Like recently I've been mentioning like task rabbit to like my friends in Philly and they're just like, what is that? And I'm yeah. like, I thought it was everywhere. Yeah. Right. And then like my friend Maddie didn't know what Equinox was and she lives in Philly. She was like, what, what is that word? It was like, <laughs> who doesn't like- know Equinox? <laughs> Especially Kanye West did put in a song. Yeah, seriously. So you would have thought by now. And it's been like in the news. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It was in the news. Um, but she's kind of spacey. Yeah, that could be it. That could be it. Yeah. Um, so I do want to say that uh, I have been to Google in New York, the Google office oh, in New York. yeah. And it is spectacular. I bet. The it's... meals are delicious. Ugh. The unlimited coconut water. Is to die well, for. Well, that, that I'm not jealous of. But do they have kombucha? They have everything. Whatever oh. you want. They have scooters. You can scoot around. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Also on the Apple and Google campuses in California, they just have, like, bikes. Yeah. And you just, like, when you're done with it, you just put it on the ground, and then you just go on your bike. And yeah. It's really kind of seems almost utopian. Yeah, a little idyllic, for sure. Which can quickly change to dystopian, as it did in this movie. <laughs> Um, and, yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to say, I wish, you know, I wish we had more stuff like that here. Same. Um, a, a security baron, um, corporate Equinox membership yeah, would yeah, be ideal. Would be great. So, you know, employees love perks, not super surprising. Um, a survey from market research firm clutch found that 53% of employees said that perks like flexible working hours, gym memberships or catered food improved their quality of life. And the perk that people wanted the most was flexible working hours. Oh, so, so not to be, you know, a total cop, <laughs> uh, but how do flexible working hours affect people's actual work? So not positively, unfortunately, a British sociologist named, you might have to help me out with the pronunciation, Gabe. Okay. Well, it's okay. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can, but <laughs> you should just go for it. I, this is wrong, but Hei Jung Chung found, yeah, that sounds really good, actually. found that people with flexible working hours actually work more than if they had set hours. And a study from Harvard looked at specifically a company that, you know, basically employs doctors and they have flexible working hours and they basically look at patient scans and analyze them, you know, on their own time. And unfortunately, the more flexible their hours, the less they got done. And it turns out when you don't have a set office or set hours, you spend a lot of time deciding when and where to work. And that takes away time from actually working. Wow. Which is disappointing because I feel like that's where we're headed as like everyone's so into flexible working hours. Okay. Hear me out for a second. Okay. So this is like, we is saying that we we don't get as much done. Yeah. But maybe that's what we need to be moving away from as a society is this idea that we have to be like the most productive people all the time. You know? Like my friends in France don't do anything, but they're happy. Yeah, I'm not saying and France that is like still doing okay. productivity is like the end all be all. It's just a study. Okay, there we go. Um but <laughs> um some people also are kind of against perks because they want They think that perks like, you know, free food and shuttles, they just serve to squeeze as much productivity out of employees as possible. Jay Maureen Henderson wrote about that in Forbes. And, you know, because if you have free dinner, then, oh, you can stay until eight because we gave you dinner. So why even, why do you even need to go home? Mm. We fed you. Keep working. So there is a dark side to perks. And that was very true in the circle. May actually lived in a dorm on campus and they had parties constantly. So she just was basically always there and it became a little 
insular, to damn, say the least. Damn, that's, that's wild. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about some data privacy yes, elements. Yes, please. Because clearly she has no actual privacy because she's living and working all, the, all together. Um, everyone knows her entire life. Um, and so, like, another big theme, you know, of the film is this data privacy concern. It's like the owners of the circle believe that all data should be accessible to everyone. They they even basically presented it as, like, not only a public good, but maybe like almost like a right. And yeah. so they, they use the example of cameras capturing different oceans to provide, to provide information to surfers. And there's definitely a case that, you know, data can be a public good, right? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Sarah Williams, an associate professor at MIT... Uh, use data to figure out how much it costs to incarcerate people in Brownsville, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn, versus how much money could be spent on re-entry programs to keep these people out of jail and re-enter them into society. And Congress used her findings when they passed the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Act of 2017, which allocated more funds to these re-entry programs across the United States. And cities like Vancouver have used data from researchers at the University of British Columbia to create more accurate bus schedules. And they're definitely not doing that in New York. <laughs> I will tell you because there's no more fake news than the bus schedules. <laughs> so data is not all bad, but it's kind of in the eye of the beholder, if you will. <laughs> I, I want to say that there is an app that will tell you when the buses are coming. It's not accurate though. I I mean, <laughs> I feel like you probably take them more often than I, I know, do. I know. I honestly never take them because they're so, it's, you never know when they're coming. I'm a biker. I'm a biker. Yeah. You're, we live different lives mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's okay. It's okay. They're private lives. <laughs> so Vastly that's different <laughs> private lives, I'll tell you. <laughs> so that's one side of the argument, you know, but there are those who think of data as something, I always go back and forth between data and data, by the way, uh, mm, something that should be, data. Wait, data. that should be privately owned. I say data. Yeah. Um, Andrew <laughs> Yang, for example, a candidate for the democratic presidential nomination. Um, you know, the, the, the inspiration for Yang gang thinks that, <laughs> thinks that data should be treated as a property right. Uh, according to Yang, which by the way, the law does a lot better <laughs> with is property rights. According to Yang, people should have the right to know what data will be collected and how it's used, the right to opt out of data collection or sharing, the right to have all of your data deleted, otherwise known as the right to be forgotten and more. This was a big case out in Europe uh, as well. Yeah. Um, he also thinks that if a company profits off your data, you should get a cut. Um, cool idea, though many say it's unrealistic. Yeah. So what's your whole, what's your, I know you're a lawyer. So what's your take on the data as a public good line of thought versus, you know, data as private property? Legally, where do we stand? Like who, <laughs> who owns data? This is what I've been trying to figure out. It is a, it is a big question, right? So... There, there are a lot of angles in which to approach it. You know, from the legal perspective, as a country, we've moved so far in the private direction that so many things that we conceive of now as public goods, I don't know if they were made in this era would be conceived of as such. You know, we have, mm, yeah. right? We have like roads, we have bridges, we have so many elements that are so fundamental to our society, subways for New York, um, uh, even the internet itself, which were, or, or microwaves, right? Like these were all stemmed from public investment. Um, the mm. idea is that the government was trying to increase the lively, the, was sort of the quality of life yeah, and livelihood ultimately of, of every, you know, person. And, and, you know, we live in a world of sovereign nation states. So generally, you know, the American people and we've shifted. Um, through a host of, you know, processes and political shifts um, to the idea of like, well, the corporation um, provides these things and it doesn't matter how they actually got to this point. Um, they are the owners of whatever they provide. And yeah. you, and then and, and every individual has this ability to opt in. Right. So technically, right, like I'm opting into Google with my information. They're providing me with a service. I'm not paying for it, yeah. but they get this, right? So the question is like, should, like how, how much, you know, they are a private company. Should the government be able to say, no, they can't do this. Yes, they can't do that. And I think it's a really uh, interesting conversation because frankly, 
even if you're not using those major companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, they are still tracking you a la Soul Search. I mean, even people who, I don't know if you know, but like Facebook tracks people who aren't on Facebook. Like there are tons of people that are still yeah, opting into that system. Yeah, because if you're a contact of someone on Facebook. Exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So there's no right. I mean, I do really like this concept of especially the right to be forgotten and taken out of search results. Because right now, and ever since, you know, the Internet's been a thing, if you post something, it's basically for it's there forever. Even if you delete it, you know, someone right. could screenshot it. Or, sure. Sure. Yeah. So. I, um, I like that you can be forgotten because I think this bubble has to explode at some point. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like we're, <laughs> it seems pretty bad right now. It seems like we're only becoming more, I mean, I think every human being has, you know, so many data points on them that yeah. you don't even need so much password anymore to know what they're about. Exactly. I mean, we live stream mm-hmm. our lives. So May really reminded me when she was live streaming of, you know, Facebook live, Instagram live, Twitter live. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that on Instagram specifically over a hundred million people watch or record live video every day on Facebook. Live videos are way more effective than just, I guess they're called stories on Facebook. I don't really use that because I'm not a boomer. You know how (laughs) Facebook has like those stories you know, the recorded yeah, yeah, yeah. stories versus the live. The live produced six times as many interactions. That's why Ten times as many comments. And they're watched for three times as long compared to pre-recorded videos. And the top performing videos on Facebook or live stream videos on Facebook are 15 to 20 minutes long. What? Which is so long. Who, to watch, and they're never anyone, this? anything, you know, entertaining even. Like I've literally watched videos of like, a side character on Vanderpump Rules curl her hair and loved it. It just feels very oh, you real. you loved it. Oh, you loved it. I loved it. it, but I was like, what am I doing? Um, Interesting. Yeah, and experts say that live streaming will be a $70.5 billion industry by 2021. I need to get in on that. I know. How do we cash in? Do we? <laughs> are we interesting enough to be live, to live stream our lives? Honestly, the people that are live streaming aren't that interesting. Good point. Good point. Good point. Let's get in there. <laughs> um, uh, now, yeah, that's nothing to sneeze. I mean, in, in China, live streaming is even more popular. Um, there are also, some, there's, let's be clear, there are some very funny live streamers in China. They got some good stuff going on. Um, you know, Taobao is their number one e-commerce website. It is where I bought all my stuff when I lived in China. It was great. Uh, and it has tons of product reviews that are actually live stream. So people can ask questions about their products in real time. Um, Taobao's number one streamer via name, uh, made over $4 million from live streaming in 2017 alone, according to the company's rankings. And that's not just from like commissions. It's like people literally send them money in the form of tips, yeah. uh, which can be anywhere from a few dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I helped just, you with this. Here's money. I need to put a tip jar for our podcast or something. I know. Does YouTube have that feature? <laughs> I, want, I want in. <laughs> uh, yeah. So let's end today by talking about facial recognition, a huge feature of sea change cameras, well, as they were called in the yes. film, The Circle. Uh, and Wait, I su- can I just tell you one trivia fact? Please tell me that fact. You know how Beck was performing at a concert at The Circle? Correct. He had an album called Sea Change, and that's why he was in the movie. Which, like, who would know that? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, but whatever. Because first I was like, that what the producers were thinking. They were like, what they was- were like, everyone's going to know this. <laughs> yeah, that is so funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, go on, go on. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah. So at Security Brand, we've done a lot of reporting on facial recognition, which is so hot right now. Yeah. Um, and so trendy. <laughs> Actually, though, it is trendy. Um, like the New York State Department of Education recently banned. Uh, Lockport City School District from using or testing facial recognition because of student privacy concerns. Additionally, many studies have found that facial recognition software doesn't work as well on women, people of color, uh, and trans folks, um, though it is improving. It is improving because it's pretty easy to improve. You just need to add a more diverse set of photos. Right, right. So it's a pretty fixable problem, but 
Um, there was a study that was comparing facial recognition softwares from all the big tech companies and Amazon's recognition software, recognition with a K, by the way, that's how you know it's tech. If like a random yeah, yeah, yeah. C is a K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, it basically, well, it, uh, it classified all the light skinned men correctly, um, but women were misclassified as men 29% of the time. And then women with darker skin were misclassified as men 31% of the time. So it's not great. <laughs> I thought this was really funny because it says, like it says light skin men. Yeah. And like, I guess that I can mean white or just like, right. Yeah. Cause it's like, it or, isn't, because it's like my family is very much a, a uh, rainbow, a gradient. Yeah. <laughs> Rainbow, <laughs> yeah, it's a gradient of color. So I wonder, like, so I wonder, like, I, I, I'm gonna start using that as like our definitions in the family. Like, I think you'd get, you'd be okay on that recognition software. Yeah, your family but, would do very differently. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but me, never gonna catch me. Never gonna, never gonna get me right. <laughs> or your mom. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? The only person that like a hundred percent would be fine would be your dad. Yeah, absolutely. So that's clearly a huge <laughs> problem because. These groups are already more likely to be subject to facial recognition, right? So black people, for example, are twice as likely to be subject to facial recognition compared to the general population in Hawaii, Michigan, and Virginia. Three times likely in Arizona, uh, Louisiana, Pennsylvania. I think I actually meant... Oh, LA. Sorry, LA. LA, like LA. LA, Pennsylvania, and San Diego. And five times as likely in Minnesota. Yikes. And then to make matters more messy, the FBI and some local police departments around the country use this software to identify suspects. So 16 states let the FBI go through pictures from their driver's licenses and ID photos. And that actually puts about half of the U.S. population in this facial recognition network, according to a study from Georgetown Law. And, you know, this is, again, it is trendy. People are very concerned that the police are, you know, making decisions based on these algorithms that may not be accurate. Um, but I wanted to know how the police actually use facial recognition. And is it that, is it as bad as people say? Like, how much are they really depending on the software? Ooh, so, you Ooh. know, ooh, so I can't say for sure. And this is actually really also, once again, very big right now yeah. uh, because uh, there's been a number of issues with uh, the ring cameras and how ooh. the pool, but we won't go into that today. Oh. We won't go into that today, people. My we will heart. get there. Um, and it is, you know, <laughs> how are the police using ring? But it really, it's like, you know, I don't know how specific police agencies are using facial recognition technology, but there was an interesting op-ed in the New York Times written by James O'Neill, the police commissioner in New York. And he says that New York police have been using facial recognition software since 2011, and they have privacy safeguards in place. Uh, okay. And he says they compare <laughs> video evidence to a database that solely consists of arrest photos, not photos from DMV, Facebook, traffic cameras, CCTVs around uh, cameras around the city. And he says that vectors are compared without reference to race, gender, or ethnicity. Uh, you know, it's just based on the distance and shapes of facial features. It's all about vectors. Yeah, it's all about the vectors. Um, now, I have a lot of thoughts related to that, but we're gonna continue, and it says, you know, software gives a list of possible matches, and an investigator, a human being, yes, um, will assess and review it further from there with other supervisors slash detectives. And then if a match is affirmed, no, uh, they will do further research on social media and other open source images, then it can become a lead. But their main point was that no one can be arrested on the basis of the computer match alone. So he compares it to tips from the Crime Stoppers hotline. Um, all tips must be verified to establish probable cause for an arrest. So how many arrests are the result of, you know, using this facial recognition technology? So in 2018, there were, you know, 7,024 requests to the facial identification section. Um, and then out of that, there was 1,851 possible matches were returned, leading to 998 arrests. Um, so essentially 14% of all requests uh, resulted in an arrest. Um, now, you know, the flip side of this um, is that software has also um, cleared people, you know, yeah. when it comes to, like false convictions, you have, 
Um, 71% of false convictions are the result of mistaken witness identifications, according to the Innocence Project. I want to just throw a quick pitch in there. Yeah. Read Just Mercy if you want to read more about elements related to that. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of other stuff out there. But Just Mercy was written by my law school professor, and it's a great book. And it's going to be a movie soon with Michael B. Jordan. Whoa. Maybe, and Jamie Foxx and Brie Larson. Maybe we'll go over that. And Tim Blake Nelson. Some faves. Nice. Yeah. Well, that was sort of a heavy episode. Heavy episode. So are we in the future? I think when it comes to this, we're, I mean, is, is the future this uh, circle world? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the concept. Then we're very close to be, we're definitely where, here we are. We're at the beginning of the circle film. Definitely. Yeah, we, we haven't gotten the soul search. We are approximating it. Yeah. And, and I would even say that there are parts of the world where they are in the soul search. Yeah, you were telling me earlier about China. So China has something called the the human flesh search engine, <sighs> which is bad name. Uh, it's Renwu uh, Suosu yeah. or something Suosu. Yeah, and in short, it uh, my Mandarin's gotten terrible. Uh, in short, people <laughs> basically can find anyone in any village um, who has done anything, and the internet vigilantes will find them um, using um, what are basically the Chinese versions of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, anyone can be found and they can lose their jobs. They can be shamed. Uh, a host of things. You can, anyone, even if they're not on those networks because of, um, you know, how connected China is. Um, so that's just one element. And we are, we are basically there in China, I would say. Yeah. You yeah. said it takes like five hours to find someone. I mean, they've done it within five hours, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't take very long and they, they don't need very much information. They need you know, someone's face, they might need the beginnings of their drive. It's a car. Oftentimes they'll just need a few numbers of the car. Um, and yeah. that's it. So we, yeah, this movie almost was less effective cause it was just like, yeah, we have all those <laughs> things. Yeah. We have drones. Like, this isn't that crazy. <laughs> yeah. We have surveillance cameras everywhere. So are we in the future? We're basically there. Go on. Yeah. So, you know, for what the circle uh, represents, you know, it, it was actually looking into the future when it was written. Even the movie was maybe looking a little bit into the future yeah. as it came out in 2013. Yeah. Um, we're not as clean and as sleek as the film made it look, mm -hmm. but in terms of like what you're capable of doing, you're, we're essentially there. That's my opinion. Yeah. I mean, we have cameras with facial recognition that are very affordable and small. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to find people really easily and very you can't easily. opt out. Like yeah. that is our, Reality. Yep. And Gen Z constantly live streams their life. Yeah. So there you are. I guess the only thing they're, they're ahead of us because they can find people in under 20 minutes. And I guess it would take us like a little bit longer. some hours, but some you hours. know, still less than a day ultimately. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, I think we're in the future. I agree. All right. Well, that's the end of our episode. Thank you for listening. Bye.